Excuse me? I have 12 o'clock, too. Okay, great. So we'll start now. Good afternoon. I'm Barbara Omstutz, president of the League of Women Voters of Central Delaware County. Welcome to our virtual hot topic discussion, Politics of a Divided America with Terry Madonna, who will share his unique insights on the upcoming election. As you know, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan civic organization. We neither support nor oppose candidates. The League is dedicated to ensuring that all eligible voters have the opportunity and the information to exercise their right to vote. The League encourages the informed and active participation of citizens in government, works to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and influences public policy through education and advocacy. Before the discussion begins, I wish to update you on the upcoming election. If you have received a mail-in ballot, it is time to complete it and return it as soon as possible. Be sure to follow the instructions on the ballot carefully and place the ballot in the secrecy envelope and sign and complete the outer envelope. We recommend returning it in person at an official drop box or at a voter services center located in Media, Upper Darby, or Chester. Locations and hours of the Voter Services Center can be found at delcopa.gov slash VSC. If you have questions about the upcoming election, go to vote411.org or call the Delaware County Voter Assistance Hotline, 610-891-VOTE, V-O-T-E. The hotline is available Monday through Friday at 8.30 a.m. to 8 o'clock p.m. and Saturday, 9 a.m. to noon. Delaware County's Voter Services Centers are standing by to help you with any questions. And you can also call any League members. We continue to adapt to COVID-19 with all LWV CDC events being delivered virtually by Zoom. Please note that our events require that you register first to receive a link. Please register under events on lwvcdc.org and you will receive a Zoom link prior to the league event. To all our guests and friends, we welcome you to join our programs and become a member of LWV CDC. We invite you to become an active participant in our committees, such as voter service or civic education. Please check out LWV CDC's November and December programming on our website. The hot topic on November 13 features League member and political science scholar Jack Nagel from the University of Pennsylvania and Jamie Mogul, a leading elections lawyer to discuss the aftermath of the election. A juvenile justice seminar is scheduled for November 17th at noon. Our virtual holiday gathering is on December 4th with County Councilwoman Monica Taylor, who will update us on the current state of information and the formation of a Delaware County Public Health Department. Just now a few minutes for a couple of housekeeping details. We have muted all participants and thank you all for all the questions provided prior to the meeting. The questions we received have been comprehensive on a wide range of issues and shared with Terry prior to the event. Olivia Thorne will ask Terry these questions after his presentation. We are very privileged today and welcome Dr. Terry Madonna at a nationally recognized political poster and commentator and director of the Center for Politics and Public Affairs at the Franklin Marshall College, where he directs the Franklin and Marshall College polls. Dr. Madonna hosts Pennsylvania Newsmakers and provides political commentary on many media outlets across Pennsylvania, including KYW-TV in Philadelphia and WGAL-TV in Lancaster. One of Pennsylvania's premier political pundits and league friend, 
Dr. Madonna will analyze the Trump pre presidency, the Trump-Biden presidential race, the politics of a divided America, and the role of Pennsylvania will play, likely play in the election. Terry, we're privileged to have you. Thank you so much. Take it away. Hey, thanks. Uh, first of all, let me say this is being recorded in uh, the data, the facts are relevant today. Who knows what could happen tomorrow? So I just want to caution everybody. Uh, it's like if polls are a snapshot in time, my speech is a snapshot in time. I'll put it that way. Uh, and if you're a little confused about this election, you're not alone. Most of us who do this for a living have a bit of confusion going on. So I want to start with uh, the way to think about the election. And then we'll get into the various aspects of it. Number one, as everybody knows, this is about 270 electoral votes, not the popular vote. If you don't believe me, ask President Hillary Clinton and President Al Gore, both of whom won the popular vote but lost the electoral college vote. And the biggest change that's, that has gone on in the last couple of years has to do with two geographic entities and demographic groups. Let's take a look at the geographic groups. Out in the southwestern part of our state, and indeed in parts of Ohio, parts of Wisconsin, parts of Michigan, why, do, why did I mention those? Well, let's just take Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, Florida, Arizona, and North Carolina. I call them the big six. Why? Donald Trump won all six in 2016. Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan by less than one percentage point. He won Pennsylvania by 44,000 votes, 0.7%. You know, that state, Florida, down there with 29 electoral votes, uh, guess what? He won Florida by one and a half points. So we're talking about a very, very narrow victory in a number of these battleground states, six of them. Donald Trump won every single one of them four years ago. And guess what? He's losing every one of them now. But again, the polls, a snapshot. If you have no life like I do, and you wake up every morning and you have to look at all this stuff, there are three good sources, Real Clear Politics, uh, Larry Sabato's crystal ball. Larry Sabato is a political science professor and a friend of mine at the University of Virginia. And Nate Silver's 538 blog. You get into the three of them and you're going to know more than you ever wanted to know, I think, about American politics. So there were, there, the movement in Pennsylvania and in some and other states has two big elements to it. And so in order to understand the presidential election, not just in Pennsylvania, but in a number of the other battleground states, you have, to, you have to get these two points. So let's go to the southwestern part of Pennsylvania into the old industrial areas where coal and iron and steel, and boy, you have to be careful how you mention this on a college campus, and coke production, you can smile, where once Critic, you know, very important to the economy. And now it's fracking, deep wells, removing the natural gas. And that's particularly important in the southwestern part of the state. Well, in 2016, guess what? Donald Trump won Beaver, Green, Washington, Westmoreland, Cambria, and Fayette counties. Are you impressed that I could name all of them off the top of my head? Every single one of them had a Democratic voter registration edge you know, over their R's, over the Republicans. Trump didn't win by five points. He didn't win by 10 points. He didn't win them by 15 points. He won them by 19, 20 points. And guess what? In two of the counties, Washington and Westmoreland, 30 percentage points. I'm gonna let that sink in. Every one of them has a Democratic voter registration edge. So what do we know about those voters? Well, they're white, they're working class. 
high school educations or less, not college educated. Many of the, their ancestors worked in the old mines and the mills and, and not, you know, and a, and a fairly significant number of them work in the natural gas industry right now, either directly or supplying goods and services to those people who do work in the, in the fracking industry. Uh, what do we know about them? Well, they're cultural conservatives on abortion, gay rights, transgender issues. What else? You better not touch the Second Amendment. Guns. No, no, no touch my gun. Third point, climate change, a pretty big issue. I think you would agree. Guess what? Not, don't touch carbon, stay away from, you know, don't eliminate natural gas. You know, a good many of the, of the uh, progressive Democrats want to do away with uh, carbon emissions and get rid of natural gas. Th those three things are important to those voters. And so why did they defect? Well, they defected because on the issues that matter to them, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump were far apart. And more importantly, Donald Trump went out into those regions. Hillary Clinton couldn't find the Southwest. She spent most of her time in Pennsylvania, in the cities and in the suburbs. Trump went out with the Rust Belt strategy. What did he say? The problem out here, in the Southwest is simple. It's very, the, the trade deals are awful, NAFTA and Trans-Pacific Partnership, and they work against you. In addition, I will bring back these old industries. And so making that argument and traveling into those regions worked. And that's a major reason why the migration is taking place. It wasn't just Trump. It has to do with the fact that the Democratic Party, as a urban and suburban party, we just want to talk about those two geographics, are exactly the opposite on what the working class want. What's that mean? Well, if you live in the, in the city of Philadelphia or you live in the suburbs, what are you more likely to be, culturally conservative or culturally liberal? What, if you live in those regions, what do you want? No gun control or gun control. If you live in those regions, what do you want? Uh, legislation dealing with climate change. And so it looked like to the working class, the Democrats moved away from them. You got it? And didn't represent them anymore. And Hillary spent no time with them. We could go up in the northeastern part of Pennsylvania as well. Northampton, Luzerne. I, I never thought in my lifetime that Luzerne County would cast more popular votes for a Republican presidential candidate uh, than we saw. I never thought that would happen. And what happened is Donald J. Trump carried Luzerne County by something like 26,000 votes. You know what else happened? You know Lackawanna County, Scranton, you know that guy who was born there, who's running for president, who lived there until he was 10? By the way, you don't have to listen to me say it. Uh, Joe Biden mentions it every five seconds when he's in the state, uh, you know, for obvious reasons. He wants people to make the connection that he's a, uh, a can I say native son? Uh, I guess I can. So, and guess what happened in Lackawanna County? Hillary carried it by only 3,500 votes. Think about that. We could also go out to a place called Erie, Erie County, you know, it's right by that lake. I think you, we all know about that lake. Working class, white working class, same demographics as I just talked about. And they went for Trump. Something else I never thought I would see. Well, if that's hurting the Democrats, what's helping the Democrats? One word, suburbs. The suburbs across our country, and in our state, particularly in Bucks, Chester, Montgomery, and Delaware counties, I think you know something about those counties. And in those counties, there's been a dramatic shift to the Democrats in the last couple of years. When I gave this talk 10 years ago, I would talk about the suburbs as being a wholly owned subsidiary of the Republican Party. 
That's no longer the case. Now, yes, they went for Hillary, uh, no doubt. But in 2018, after two years of the Trump presidency, the suburbs dramatically shifted to the Democrats. Why do I say that? Well, the Democrats won three of the four congressional seats in the, in the Philly Burbs, in Montgomery, in the fourth, fifth, and sixth congressional districts, Montgomery, Delaware, and Chester counties. And, and they won a seat in the Lehigh Valley. So it was 13 Republicans and five Democrats uh, until 2018. Now it's 9-9. Now the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, as you know, redid the boundary lines in February of 2018. And that certainly helped the Democrats by the uh, redrawing of the district lines. But the wave that took place, the Democrats won 40, they won 41 congressional seats in 2018. How many different ways can you say Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi? You following that? Well, here's what has gone on in the Philly Burbs. College educated women have moved decisively towards the Democrats, decisively, along with millennials. They're the, they're the 23 to 38 year olds. I hope you're seated. There are only 80 million of them and they're going to own our politics and our economy in the not too distant, just from the sheer size of, of the sheer size. You know what they did in 2016? Yes, their turnout is the lowest of any age cohort. Yes, but they gave a larger percentage of their vote to Hillary Clinton than any other age cohort. Gen X, baby boomers, those of you over 70, the silent generation, as you were, as, as we, I can add that, as we are known as. And so, and they heavily populate the suburbs. And you also know what happened last year in the municipal elections. Guess what party won county government control in Bucks, Chester, Delaware, and Montgomery. Am I right about that? The Delaware County Council. See, I know this stuff. I, 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 I can make it up, but there's some things that I actually know. I'm just having fun, trying to keep a sense of humor. All right. And so right now, as we look at the state and Joe Biden and I looked earlier today, it could change, had a 5.1 percentage point lead in Pennsylvania, 5.1, you got it? Why? Well, Trump's not doing as well with working class voters out in the Southwest and up in the Northeast. He's not doing as well. And that's one of the reasons, one of the reasons why Joe Biden is leading the state. Point number two, he is getting, Trump is getting clobbered in the Philly suburbs, clobbered because of the migration that I talked about from college educated women. Some of them, by the way, Republican college educated women. And you know what happened in the registration drives down there. The Democrats have picked up seats in the burbs. In, in many of the other net throughout the state, and again, this is something you know, the Republicans have picked up seats net in throughout the state. And so we've got these sort of two things going on at the same time that are critically important in terms of the dimensions. Well, why is, why, uh, one of the reasons that Donald J. Trump is not doing as well with the working class voters is a guy named Joe Biden, unlike Hillary Clinton, has, is, is and has campaigned among them. He's called Working Joe Biden. He has a lot of names. He's Sleepy Joe, too, if you listen to President Trump, but you get the point. So what did Joe Biden do? Well, about five weeks ago, he goes out to Allegheny County, which is a Democratic, and did, and did vote for Hillary. You go out there in that district, that, in that region, with these white working class voters who went for Trump, and you know what Biden, you know what Biden did? He stood up in a press conference and said, I am for fracking. 
You got it? Meaning he's making a direct appeal on a subject of great importance to the region. And by the way, not all Democrats oppose it. Tom Wolf is, Governor Wolf is, supports fracking. Now he wants a severance tax. You know what that is. And he is concerned about the leakage from the pipelines, you know, and the environmental uh, concerns there. But make no mistake about it. Make no mistake about it. Joe Biden is making a big appeal to the working class. And it, so far, it, 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 it's benefiting him, as is this big lead he has in the Philadelphia suburbs. In 2018, the suburbs, not just in PA, but across the country have been shifting. And I can't overstate the significance of that long-term for, our, for our, our politics. All right, so as I said, Donald Trump now is losing all six battleground states. Some of them are close, and I don't wanna bore you with this, but I will. North Carolina, the lead's 1.5. Arizona, the lead's 3.2. Uh, uh, Florida, 1.5, you get it? It's really very, very close. Now, in a couple of the others, like Michigan and Wisconsin, it's pretty big. In, in Michigan, it, it's over seven percentage points, and in Wisconsin, it's almost five points. So, you know, the president has a lot of work to do I think it's very hard to lose two or more of these if the president does and get the 270 electoral votes. Do you follow that? I just think it's going to be very different. And I'm not suggesting there aren't other important states, uh, Georgia, Texas, Ohio, for example. Uh, Trump has a four-point lead in Texas, and if he doesn't win Texas, you know he's not going to win the Electoral College. All right, let's turn to something else. Uh, job performance. The president's job performance, as we, as I talk with you right now, Real Clear Politics average is about 44% positive. 44% positive. If you go through history, if you go through history, modern history, since we've had scientific polling, president, no president has won re-election with a job performance below 49, 50% positive. Trump's at 44. Trump's job performance has been literally un not, I won't say unchangeable, but the range has been 40 to 46%, 40 to 40. Look how narrow that is. If you go to other presidents, they varied 15, 20 points. You know what I mean? Up high and then down low. But the polarization is so great that virtually nothing moves the dial very much. Yeah, you get these changes, three, four points here and there but no big swings. I almost fell off my chair, and I can do that regularly. About six weeks ago, Gallup came out with a poll, and here's on the job performance of the president. 90% of Republicans gave him a positive job performance, 90%. Wow, again, I'm glad you're seated. Democrats, 2%. How about that gap? Now, if you look at other polls, which I do regularly, the Democrats' approval is in single digits. Single digits. And the Republicans are 85 to 90%. So regardless of what happened, a little movement up and a little movement down because of the polarization. I spent some time after the debate last night answering reporter questions. Did it change anything? And I said, I think Republicans left the debate saying Trump won. Democrats said, you know, their supporters said Biden won. I, I, I would be stunned if we see any startling movement given the heavy polarization. Here's the way I like to put it. Trump does something good. He got it good. Republicans cheer, Democrats criticize. Trump does something bad, Republicans cheer, and Democrats criticize. You got it? Look at the events that have taken place and have not shaken the race up. The violence, the bloodshed, the looting and the burning in the cities and the, mur and the murder rate, which Trump has made a big deal of. Let's go to the first debate. Not exactly a roaring success for President Trump. You all agree with that? I don't know how you could. Let's go to number three, Justice Ginsburg dies. Let's go to number four, the president 
nominates Judge Barrett to the United States Supreme Court, and we know what's going on yesterday in, a, in the Judiciary Committee and a vote, I guess, on Sunday before the full Senate for confirmation. The polls up, down, just a little. Why? Because, because this election is so dominated, if you will, by voters who have made up their mind. The number of undecided voters is, at this point, very, very low compared to past ones. What, what do I mean by that? Well, only about 11%, and this is a couple, uh, you know, this is something I looked at earlier, a couple of weeks ago, it could have changed now, undecided voters. In Pennsylvania, in the September f and poll, fewer than 10% of the Republicans and Democrats undecided, fewer, that's it. Think about that. So, and what do we know about undecided and independent voters? I'll put it to you this way, and I shouldn't say this, but you know college professors. Listen to this. You're undecided? What more do you need to know, <laughs> right? After almost four years of a Trump presidency, and Biden has been on the scene for, you know, 3,000 years, 47. But so the bigger point I'm trying to make here is simple. If you haven't made up your mind, what are you doing? And I don't mean it meanly, but what do we know about undecideds and independents? They don't follow the campaigns closely. They don't vote as frequently. And they often lean one way or another. You know what I mean? They may be undecided, but eh, they're leaning in one, one way or the other. So it'll be, I, this election is primarily about the base, B-A-S-C, getting out your core voters. I'm not saying they're not trying to win some of the undecideds, but that's certainly, that's certainly the case. All right, the biggest single problem that President Trump has is, his, is the approval, or lack of approval, I should say, for how he's handled COVID-19. And you notice that was the first topic. And probably when it comes to uh, Biden's strongest suit last night, it was on that issue of COVID-19. The president's strongest suit, by the way, came on crime when he went back into the 19, what, 1994 in the crime bill. And, and Biden has to admit that that was a mistake. Parts of it were a mistake anyway. And so that's President Trump's most serious problem. And, and in our state, in the September f and poll, it was ranked as the number one problem. 25% of our voters said it was the most significant problem. All right, I wanna move along here, it's 1228. I wanna, oh, when pollsters say, ask voters, well, what, uh, who can best handle, Biden, Trump, handle uh, foreign policy, uh, healthcare, which candidate do you trust? Which candidate is more honest? Go through a whole thing. Guess what? Only one does President Trump best Joe Biden. Only one. And you know what it is? You know what it is. The economy. The economy. Throughout America, and by the way, his job performance on handling the economy is 50% positive. I'll let that sink in. Well, what do we know about the economy? Historically, throughout American history, the economy has been the single most important issue in campaigns. Now, obviously, we had a civil war. I'm not saying in every single election. But how about this? How about th th this little, these factoids? We've had two presidents in recent history, he sought a second term and lost. You follow that? Lost. Jimmy Carter in 1980 to Ronald Reagan. Well, why did Carter lose? Well, yes, we had the Iranian hostage crisis. You may recall when a, a packed load of students captured the American embassy and held our people hostage, embassy personnel hostage. But there was something else going on. It was called stagflation, double digit unemployment and double digit inflation at the same time. The economists I talked to said, you, you couldn't have that. You know what I mean? How can you have inflation with people out of work, not spending any money, not borrowing money? You, you get it. And guess where 
Jimmy Carter's job performance was in the 30s, positive. Then we have a guy named George Herbert Walker Bush, who was seeking a second term in 1992, and he was running against a guy named Bill Clinton. Well, we were in recession, and Bill Clinton won handily. Remember that guy, James Carville? He used to hang around out in the southeastern Pennsylvania where you are. He, he ran Clinton's campaign, uh, he and Paul Begala, back in 1992. And, but, and Carville came up with one of the great expressions of all time when asked why, uh, why Bill Clinton won. He said, it's the economy stupid. You got it? And Barack Obama won the presidency in 2008 because of what we then, well, we still refer to it as the Great Recession. You got it? So Bush, Bush, Carter, job performances in the 30s. You got it? Job performances in the 30s. So as we sit here right now, President Trump's strongest asset is the fact that he that more people think he can best handle the economy and create jobs. You follow that? And we're going to have to wait and see. And so what does the president talk about? The best economy before COVID-19 in the history of the country. I'll let the economic historians debate whether it's the best economy, but it was pretty good. We got to be candid and objective about this. With low, 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 low unemployment for people of color, for Hispanics, for Asians. Uh, and I'm not saying that the wealthy haven't benefited more, but there was certainly a pretty good economy. After COVID-19, of course, that changes. We go into recession. So Trump is arguing we are coming out of the recession quicker and faster than, any, you know, than anyone could have expected except Donald J. Trump. And he argues that in the third quarter, the numbers of which we'll get the Friday before the election on gross domestic product, unemployment, number of people collecting unemployment compensation, he says it's going to show pretty startling improvement. And in 2021, the economy will be roaring again. And so the problem that the president has is COVID-19 is still, you know, uh, his most serious problem and the economy, though it's getting better, there's still lots of people who are, who are suffering as a result of it. And we're just going to have to wait and see. Right now, most of the prognosticators say this. One, that uh, if you look at the models, Joe Biden is statistically, and with the models, the favorite to win the presidency of the United States. But you know what they do? You know what caveat they put out? We're not ruling out that Trump could get the 270 electoral votes. You follow this? Even if he loses the popular vote even greater than the margin of the popular vote that Hillary Clinton defeated him in 2016. And so there's a big debate about Congress and a big debate about the Pennsylvania legislature and what's likely to happen there. We can talk about those in questions. But it's 1234, so why don't I stop here and we'll take any questions or I'll go on to my next event, whatever, whatever comes first. Did that make any sense? I'm just joking, just having fun. Olivia, do you wanna share some of the questions that were submitted earlier? Yes, I do. And, and um, there are a lot of questions and I'm not sure exactly where to begin exactly, but um, one you were talked about the support um, and uh, of different groups, are the Bernie supporters? Um, how will the how are they going to vote? Um, Bernie, Bernie Bernie Sanders supporters. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know he's out in Pittsburgh. Uh, the fact of the matter is that progressives are going to vote for Joe Biden because of the opposite. You got it. Okay. And I think they believe that they can that if they win the Senate. And again, odds are they'll win the Senate. I'm not saying that will happen. I'm just saying. The prognosticators say the Democrats are more likely to win the Senate. So the progressives think they can, they will get Biden to do their agenda. You got it? And so what are they going to do? Sit out and let Trump win? They want Trump to win? 
Of course they don't. The Democrats are galvanized just as the Republicans are in the other direction. You follow that? So I, I think that's the short answer, but I think that's the correct one. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question was, how much will the revelations about President Trump's taxes and business finances affect the vote? Well, we're going to have to wait and see. You know, he's going to put that all off. And, and there's not a lot new about that. Of course, the Chinese bank account and the fact that, what, he paid $750. And, and that's probably a fee to file the taxes. But he argues he's paid millions and millions and millions, you know, uh, pre-tax, you know, getting uh, as, as part of the normal business operations. I think most voters are aware of that. Uh, just as they're aware of the Hunter Biden situation in the Ukraine with Burisma, the natural gas thing, and, you know, Trump made a big deal of that last evening, despite the fact that it wasn't on the agenda. But that never stopped, the, that doesn't stop either candidate from veering off into the direction they want to go to be objective about it. So at the moment, I, I think the people who, you know, unless there's something profound, you know what I mean, profound that comes out, I, 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 I think neither of those is going to be a big deal. Okay. Um, the, um, there's one that's sort of in a different direction. Um, is um, We were talking about, uh, you're talking about polling. And um, does the frequency or daily polling during a presidential election affect a voters' opinions? You said that I, everybody can get up their minds, but, you know. I get that question all the time. And that's <laughs> one that, you know, we did a lot of... The, People who do what I do did a lot of research 20, 30 years ago. There's no evidence when people have a view that just because their candidate isn't going to win that they're not going to vote. They, they, I, in all my years of doing what I'm doing, I've never seen the differences between Democrats and Republicans like we have now. You have to struggle to find two things they agree on. And I often say the one thing that Democrats and Republicans agree on is medical marijuana. They don't agree on recreational marijuana, which as you know, a guy, what's that guy's name? Oh, Tom Wolf. And what's the other guy's name? Oh, John Fetterman. Guess what they want to do? And by the way, 58% of Pennsylvania voters favor legalizing recreational pot. Uh, far more Democrats than Republicans, as you would expect. The other thing I, I, about uh, about polls is uh, which spam call phone calls should I answer in order to be included in a political poll? <laughs> yeah, know? that's a great question because I don't I don't answer my hard line. I don't know what <laughs> I don't know what you do. Uh, yeah, I mean I'd pick it up and see if it's a reputable. Here's what at Franklin and Marshall College, the Center for Opinion Research, does the poll for me. They send. They, they get a random sample of Pennsylvania voters from a company that specializes in it. So they randomly select, let's say for the sake of this discussion, 3,000 names. Too many, but let's say 3,000. And so they have the names, the addresses, and the phone numbers of the registered voter. So at FNM, a card is mailed out to all the voters that have been randomly selected to be interviewed. And the card says, you've been selected to be interviewed, blah, 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 by Franklin and Marshall College. Here's an 800 number you can call us, and it gives the hours. Uh, here's a link you can take the poll online. And by the way, we'll call you. So people know that when they hear it's from Franklin and Marshall College, and I think that's, uh, that that's very important because it reduces, you know, what we call it, it reduces the low response rate. It raises, meaning the people who are eligible to be interviewed who you don't interview. And, and that's, that's important. The other one that you, know, you were just talking a minute ago about the vision in the, uh, in the country. And uh, can you suggest any ways to diminish or heal the division? I wish that I could. <laughs> I wish I could. I you know what? The answer of that answer. I have to say this: sometimes it takes a, a very serious crisis to get America. I mean, to get us right now. I think it would it 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 would take that. Here's something else that I, I 
what, what many voters tend to do is to watch the TV stations, listen to the radio stations, and read the newspapers whose viewpoints they agree with. And there's not enough, I used to say this back in the day. I, I used to say this back in the day. I have an obligation to watch Bill O'Reilly and Chris Matthews. You get the point, MSNBC and Fox. So I, I flip around because I have an obligation to hear what differing viewpoints are and most people aren't doing this anymore. So they get their own views reinforced and they don't get enough from the other side. And I just don't think that makes any sense. And, I, and I, I've argued that for a long, long time. Uh, and the other thing is you notice you can't tell my political party and who I support. I have to keep that out of the analysis and stick to you know, the big facts. Now you have to interpret the facts. I'm not saying you don't do that, but uh, too many people aren't even willing to listen to the other viewpoint. Thank you. Uh, um, another thing we were talking about different groups and the millennials and all, but how important are the young people this year? They seem to be very energized. And I know that a lot of people have spent a lot of time trying to get them all registered. And, um, no, no, I think the turnout among younger voters are, you know, about 45%, you know, they have the lowest turnout of any age cohort. You got it? The lowest turnout. I think the turnout is going to be up along most demographic groups and also among young voters. Uh, I, I would be surprised. There's a lot of activity going on to reach out to these voters. And, and guess what issue they're really solid on climate change and the environment. Yeah. That's a big issue. I'm not saying they don't have other issues, but boy, does that come up frequently. Um, the, um, <clears throat> the, um, one, there was a question here about um, how and what we need to do to align with uh, if there's a dispute over the results in Pennsylvania. And I think oh. this sort of brings up a series of questions now that are about the results and um, what is going to happen and, and your thoughts on how we can sort of put this together. How many, how many different ways can you say court? <laughs> I would be stunned. I would be stunned if in, in a variety of states there weren't challenges to various aspects of the voting. And you, know, you might think mail-in voting would be at the top of the list, but you also could have problems with poll watchers. You could have out, actually, God forbid, we have violence, mayhem outside of polling places, and some have indicated already the need to do what? The need to have security on hand. And so, and look, in Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, which the U.S. Supreme Court couldn't decide because they tied 4-4, we have, uh, the election officials have three days to Friday of election week to count the mail-in ballots. And now the Supreme Court has said, well, if it's not postmarked, but you get it, you know, and you got to take it, even if it wasn't post, you know, if there's no postmark, how do you know it was submitted by election day, November 3? I, I would be stunned if we don't have multiple lawsuits. And I'm not just saying by Republicans, it could be Democrats, it, particularly if it's close. Here's the way to think about it. Three, by three to one, Democrats are voting by mail over Republicans, three to one. You got that? So, it, and more Republicans are gonna vote in person. So what are we gonna know at the evening of November 3rd? It's gonna look like a Donald J. Trump won, but what happens when they count the mail-in ballots, you see? And we can't do it early in the state. There were efforts made I like what Florida does. Florida, three weeks before November 3rd, they can begin to process the ballots. Now, they have to be done in, with, in proper security. Folks like you have to be on the hand, on hand monitoring it, and each party has to have representatives. Uh, and I don't really know why we couldn't begin to count those ballots before what, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Uh, back in... Now, in, in defense of the election officials, they've hired a whole bunch of new staff people, you know, to get this thing moving along. And I'm not saying they can't get it done, but some experts say it could be weeks 
until we, if it's close, in many of these battleground states, it could be weeks until we know who won because of the court activities that are going to take place. In the Pennsylvania primary on June 2nd, 1.5 million Pennsylvanians uh, cast ballots by mail or absentee. It took two full weeks to have every election certified in our state. Two full weeks. So how many different ways can you say court, 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 court? This sort of brings up another one that was asked was um, whether or not um, there are any safeguards that, that um, if, if, um, if uh, Donald Trump decided he would not peace, he was not reelected and did not want to leave office. Is there anything that, or is this another whole meeting for the meeting that Jack Nagel, I know, is here, um, and can talk about it the next meeting after the election, but I just didn't know if you had anything you wanted to throw in. Well, well. I mean, the Constitution lays out the broad, the broad frame, framework. I mean, you know, uh, if he doesn't leave on January 20, I, I mean, he's already said his advisors have, have told the press that he will leave, you know, and I think he may have even said that, uh, but there will have to be all these court challenges and he may wait until the end of the court challenges. But how about this on January 20, if the electoral college hasn't been definitive or, you know, nobody has 270 and the Democrats retain control of the house, how many different ways can you say acting president Nancy Pelosi? You follow that? Uh, okay. Yes. <laughs> and so we're, we're, we're just going to have to wait. Uh, we're just going to have to wait and see, but I, 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 I don't actually think he he would remain. I know I may be alone about that. This Olivia, we ha we have a few questions here that came through the okay. chat. Are there any more that you would like to ask? That well, there are there are a few more, but if you let's go on and get some of the live ones because of the people that have put them in today because they may be more related to what Terry's already talked about. Okay. You read them? Okay. Um, Terry, could you please comment on the Election Integrity Committee, um, which quickly passed by the state Republican House with subpoena power to question votes after the election? I thought they, they, they ended that, or am I wrong? I thought they had too. Yeah, I, I don't think it's in place. I, th I think that's been uh, dropped. Okay. Thank you. Um, will there be any change in which party um, is in the majority in Pennsylvania House and Senate? Well, the Cook Report has now said that the House of Representatives is a toss-up, a toss-up. Up until then, the Cook Report said that it, the House and the Senate lean, lean Republican, which meant the Republicans would remain control. Uh, they need, the Democrats need nine seats in the State House. Uh, you know, to take it over. Uh, again, the, the problem is that a lot of the competitive seats, competitive seats went Democratic in 2018, many of them down where you live in the burbs. And the fact of the matter is that there aren't as many, uh, uh, you know, critical competitive districts left. I'm not suggesting they can't win the nine. Remember, the Democrats won 11 seats in the state house and five state seats in the state senate and we're just going to have to wait and see uh would i rule it out no no i wouldn't rule it out completely okay um have one here um do you think republican legislatures will replace electors to get the president to 270 Will the election end up in the Supreme Court? First of all, uh, that's, there's a lot of rumors going around that the Republicans in the legislature, if it's closer or whatever reason, will name the electors, regardless of what the popular vote is, or if it's contested. I, I, re I really doubt that. I mean, uh, there's been these rumors, but there's been nothing authoritative about it. And here's something to remember. The Constitution of the United States gives the state legislatures, the power over the electors. You got it? The, the, and, and so 
who knows how that's going to turn out, uh, but they could substitute it. And the other thing is, once electors are chosen by the voters, win the popular vote in Pennsylvania, the 20 electors, you know, if the Democrats win or Democrats, they go to the state capitals all over the country in December to cast the electoral votes. And regardless of the pledge they sign, whatever name they submit is counted. You got that. Now, some states have imposed fines and penalties on electors that violate their pledge. But whatever the, I love this expression, those electors are called faithless electors. You got to love that, don't you? Faithless electors. But, and they have never changed the outcome of an election. You follow that? Even though there have been, you know, been, uh, you know, two of Trump's electors didn't vote for him. He had 306 when the Electoral College was done. He had 304 and Hillary lost a couple. It's not uncommon. I don't know if I answered, but that's, who knows? Okay. Um, does the increase in Republican red registration necessarily mean a vote for Trump? No, not, ne not necessarily, although it's taken place, the Republican increase has taken place in, for the most part, in Republican districts. You got that? Now, it's also taken place out in these working class counties with a Democratic voter registration. You follow me? And so those voters are now Republican, just like a lot of the college educated women in the suburbs are now Democrats, even if they retain their Republican, you know, their, their, their registration the way, the, the way it is. So you can't, you know, you can't say every single one of them will, obviously. And I've not seen any polls on the people who've changed their registration or who signed up for the first time. Remember, that's also going up. Okay, so those are all the chat questions we have. Um, well, I do have a couple more, Barbara, if you want. Uh, okay, excellent. Um, uh, one, uh, let me see here, just going down. Um, one of the president's duties is to be uh, America's moral compass. Is this happening or not happening? And <laughs> I think you probably know the answer to that one, but I just thought it, you might have something different to say about it. That well, everybody's going to have their view of it, aren't they? They and, are. And I think the Democrats are going to have a different view than the Republicans, uh, with, with, without doubt. And Biden has made a big deal on the campaign trail about uniting the country, you know, uniting, ending the divisiveness and the bitterness. The, the, you can probably do that in terms of your verbiage, but I don't know how you do it in terms of your vote, given this, you know, crazy polarization that we have right now. And we have one word that's missing from our legislature in many cases, not all, to, always, and the same in Congress, it's called compromise. Like they did the latest stimulus bill, right? Yes. Well, there's actually a question about this. It says, please comment on the origin of divisiveness between the political parties. Members of the Tea Party were critical of the Republicans who are willing to compromise on certain legislation between the different parties. But I don't know if anything ties in with what you just said at that. Well, I mean, we've had divisiveness. Remember, we had something called the Civil War. And then we had something called Reconstruction. So there's no doubt about that. We've, and we had divisiveness over FDR's New Deal, uh, no, no, no doubt. But since we've had scientific polling, I don't think we've had the divisiveness like we have now, but all throughout American history, oh, we've had, you know, we've had a lot of, uh, a lot of divisiveness. There's, there's this politically, that's just no doubt. I, one of the questions that sort of gets thrown in here from different ways to people putting it is that what is there anything that we can say as an organization um, that to give people some confidence that this 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 election can work and that we can make everything I mean we keep saying it you know but are there is there any messaging that should go along with this to to try to help us. Well, the, the real problem is going to be if the results aren't clear. 
and they're muddled and we have all these court activities going on. I think that'll be the real problem. You almost hope that one candidate or the other will win decisively so we can at yeah. least not have a battle over the presidential election. We're going, I, I, and I, I don't know how we fail to have it. I'll be can't, I would, I would love to be wrong about this and have a decisive victory by one or the other uh, of the candidates and get out of, you know, this, uh, the endless battle for the electoral college, 270 votes. Well, I think it all comes back one more time that, and the other questions that dealt with that was just, it, what can we do to make <laughs> make this better? And, and the answer is, we've just got to go out and vote, I think, probably. Well, we got to vote and we've got to urge our lawmakers to compromise. That's all. You, you know, you don't get everything you want in a, in a republic like ours. I mean, you just have to do. And right now, everything is so polarized and political. It's, it's hard to get anything done. Look at the differences between Governor Wolf and the Republicans on how quickly the economy should open and how it how should it open. These differences are huge. Do you think there'll be more bipartisanship after the election? Now, when they no longer have to pick a side type thing? I, I don't know why. I okay. mean, I don't know why. <laughs> That was the other uh, question, but <laughs> that was pretty much it. Well, look, it's about one o'clock. I want to thank, thank you. you. I hope Everybody stay safe, and uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed the, uh, I think I made a presentation. One, you did. Okay, before, before, we close, before we close, Terry, we just want to thank you. Um, and uh, we hope all of our guests and friends have found this program very educational and thought for Brooklyn. Thank you so much. Um, your role in educating the voter really is our essential purpose at the League. Um, your work over the years has provided voters the information they need to make informed and engaged uh, choices towards good governance. And we really appreciate all the excellent work you do to help preserve our democracy. Thank you. Thank you. So, well, thank I've you tried so to, uh, before I go, look, I'm trying to keep a sense of humor and keep it a little light. It's, I'm not suggesting it's not a very serious subject. It's, it's hugely important, but... I just would encourage people to try to keep a little sense of humor and not get all bent, you know, bent, put it this way, bent out of shape over it. I can, I have those moments myself for obvious reasons, but stay a little lighthearted and, and, you know, try, try to enjoy what we can get out of this. But thank you. Thank you. Other, Barbara, there's one other question that just came up was, um, okay. uh, that, uh, where, where can they see the recording? And the answer is on our website, right, Kathy? Am I saying that right? Yes. <laughs> you know? Yes. And the other thing was, well, when will the drop box votes be counted was one of the other questions I've been asked. And since I happen to know the answer to that, um, they are, we start to be counted on a Tuesday morning after seven o'clock. But first they have to open each That's envelope exactly right. and put it separately. And then they stir the ballots in the security right. envelopes in a, a large bin, and then they'll start opening. So you'd like to think by nine or 10 o'clock that they would have started to count the ballots right. and the ballot machines can count somewhere between 2,000 and 2,500 ballots per hour. So right. I think that in the mail-in, it should not be quite yeah. as long, I hope. And I love and I love this expression. Uh, hopefully, there won't be too many naked ballots. Oh yes, <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, we certainly are seeing enough ads. My daughter was because down from Massachusetts. They, they won't be counted. Like, I they can't believe this. That's they all they talk be, about. <laughs> they won't be counted. At any rate, I'm out of here. I'll see Thank you all. Thank you so much, Terry. It's My been pleasure. Terry, more time. It. Wonderful job. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you.